morning. I want to add my welcome to Justin's. If you're here this morning as a visitor for the first time, I hope you'll commit to two weeks because I'm not the preacher. I'm the substitute. So you'll get, if you come back next week, you'll get to hear the real thing. One thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. One thing, that's the two words you have to remember from today, one thing, and I, and I totally agree with what Jeff said about the cross, I hope that this sermon leads you in the same direction. <clears throat> Sometime in about 1988, a group of men gathered in a living room in North Dallas. These men were solid people from a solid church, and it was a doctrine preaching church, a church that was, had an expository pulpit, a church that understood the doctrines of grace, and uh, it was a growing church. People were excited about the Bible, the church was full every Sunday, and that church had already planted two churches before this. And there was a belief that it should happen a third time. And if I was to tell you the name of the church, some of you would probably recognize it. It's still a faithful church. But um, it seemed like it was time for some of us to move on. The church was overcrowded, and um, it had a history of planting. We thought it, it might be time to, uh, to think about that. Uh, it was Since it was a doctrine-preaching church, one thing that happens in these kinds of churches is there, there do arise some uh, differences of emphasis, so we thought maybe a, a second church with a slightly different emphasis would, would please a lot of people and uh, glorify the Lord. And the preacher who was the main substitute pulpit in that church was willing to lead the, the, the group. So all the, all the uh, key elements were present. And I was there that night in that living room, and there were about 19 men and when they had eaten some refreshments and settled down to business, the, the leader asked uh, each of us to go around the room and see, uh, just state what we thought we wanted to see in a new church. And that's when things fell apart. I was about 29 years old, and it just felt like I really grew in my understanding of people that night. Um, out of those 19 men, there were 19 different reasons to start a new church. Um, it was shocking to me. I thought that we were united on essentially one thing, Jesus Christ, and that it would be, at least it might have um, coalesced into a couple of uh, options. But no, 19 literally different, incredibly different philosophies of what the new church ought to be. And uh, the low point was when one of them said, I've always wanted to be in a church with a men's softball team. Okay. That meeting went on a, a while longer, I think mo mostly for the sake of appearances. Uh, it did not go past that evening. It never, there was no second meeting. But I think about that a lot because Cornerstone would like to plant a church. We would like to uh, um, quiet, uh, what, what's the word? Um, in, order, in an orderly fashion, split ourselves into two groups, hopefully concentrating on one thing, the glory of Jesus Christ. And I would love to think that it can happen here. Um, there has been times in Cornerstone's past where we had to stop and, and regroup and see if there was one unifying theme among us, and it did happen, and it can happen again. Well, we have in today's text, Psalm 27, 4, one of those times when Scripture zeroes in and says, there's one thing, and um, pretty much the only thing, in a sense. Um, there may be a, a few other passages that come to your mind when you think of a thing like that. Um, Jesus says to Martha, uh, one thing is necessary, and Mary has chosen that thing. Um, it won't be taken away from her. Or Peter, uh, when, when he gets all uh, excited about whether 
the Apostle John is going to live till Jesus returns. Jesus says to him, Peter, what is that to you? You follow me. There's just one thing. Or when Paul says, I determined to know nothing among you, 1 Corinthians, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So, so not only are there parallel verses, I think, that say there's one thing, but I think you'll see as we look through this that they are the same thing. The thing that David is asking for is the same thing that, the, that Scripture over and over again says to concentrate on, namely to possess and seek a relationship with Christ. <clears throat> so let's listen to the entire psalm. Um, it takes one minute and 55 seconds to read. I, t I timed it. So let's hear the whole thing. Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I have asked of the Lord, that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. <coughs> he will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high on a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off, forsake me not. O God of my salvation, for my father and mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have arisen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Let's pray and give this time to Jesus. Oh Lord, this is your word that we're handling this morning. And I do pray that it will be to your glory and it will be accurate and it will be heartfelt. And that we will, we will come with more fervent prayer to you in the future. More seeking of you, more loving of you more knowing what the basis of our relationship is with you. And so, Father, it is your time, it is your glory, it is your hour. Do bless it for us. And, Father, do remember our brother Ken Steelman, especially this morning as he tries to recover his breathing. We ask that you look after him this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, when you get to preach one Sunday, the Psalms are a great choice. Um, they, for one thing, we love them. We all love them. And for another thing, they're small. And they don't have much context. You don't have to pick a, a verse out of Romans and then explain half the book just to get to what that one verse means. So um, I love going to the Psalms. I know that Jeff does too. We've had so many Psalms expounded by him. And... Um, they're, they're precious to us. This one in particular to me. I, I, I hope that each psalm has, has a special meaning to you, but maybe this one has been particularly comforting to you. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Uh, maybe that has spoken to you at times of your life. Uh, for me, it was really young. I, was, I had Gideon New Testament when I was a teenager, and I, w I remember reading psalms like this in the back room at my grandmother's house, wondering why the rest of my family wouldn't follow me in uh, faith, in, in the uh, conversion. And uh, so these kinds of verses where my father and my mother forsake me, but you will be with me, those were, those 
those seemed like they were really um, uh, applicable to me, and I would, I would take comfort from that. So I hope this is, is one of those to you, but if it's not, maybe this will be your introduction to it. I said there's not a lot of context in these psalms. Um, there's a little bit. Let's, ex let's at least talk about what David is facing in the middle of uh, when he gets to verse 4. If you look up and down in the psalm from, from verse 4 above and below, you have enemies and evildoers that are mentioned in several verses. When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, though an army encamp against me, give me not up to the will of my adversaries. We also have possible abandonment, either by the Lord or by our relatives. Hide not your face from me. Cast me not off. Forsake me not. For my father and mother have forsaken me. We also have fear at least the possibility of fear. Whom shall I fear, he says. And contrasted with courage, uh, though war rise against me, I will be confident. And most of all, I think that you have over and over again repeated this utter reliability of the Lord our God in our life. Uh, the Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is my stronghold. He will hide me in his shelter. He will conceal me. My head shall be lifted up. The Lord will take me in. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So that's where David is. There's been a lot of people trying to assign this to some period of his life without any success. We don't have to do that. But we know that he's at a time of confidence, I believe. Uh, there certainly are uh, prayers and worries here, but it's a confident time for him. Uh, the first six verses are basically statements of fact, and the, the last eight are prayers and petitions, but that's just a rough outline. But I do know that what, has, what is here has spoken to the saints for about 3,000 years. Also, I want to mention that Jeremy Dice uh, taught on this psalm a couple years ago, and you can find that lesson on our website. So turning now to verse 4, which to me is the heart of the song, David now says that there's just one thing that he's asking for. He's, he's trying to focus our attention. Remember, he's singing to himself, but he's also singing to you. He's got his ear t trained both ways, and he's, he's trying to speak to the saints. So he says, I, I'm just asking for one thing, and that's, that's a rhetorical device. That he's literally not, has not stopped praying for other things. He's just saying that he believes and he wants us to believe that everything else can be seen in the light of this one thing and the, or that the one thing in a sense contains all the other things. So it's a figure of speech, but uh, he means it really seriously. And I think he would like to say to us that if our other things don't fit into this one thing, then we're warped, we're skewed. We're sort of double-minded, like James would say. But at this particular time in his life, David is single-minded. He says, if just this one thing comes true, uh, which is that I can have lasting fellowship with God, then all my other prayers will be answered as well. So he doesn't just ask for it. He says, I've asked this of the Lord, that I will seek after. I noticed when I was studying that a lot of the other translations take out this seeking. The Net Bible says, I've asked the Lord for one thing, that is what I desire. And the, the HCSB follows that. I've asked the Lord one thing from the Lord, it is what I desire. And I know that this is Hebrew poetry and we've, we're used to things being spoken in parallel, but I think that they've taken out some of the meaning of this word. The word doesn't just mean desire. I'm, not a Hebrew scholar, but I do know how to look things up and compare notes. And it is a word that means um, seeking, um, striving, looking for someone or something. So he's striving for this. He's not just asking for it. He's, he's trying to turn his attention to it and strive for this fellowship with the Lord that he's asking for. You can ask for something and be pretty half-hearted about it, right? I know... Maybe this 
Maybe I'm the only one, but I've asked for repentance sometimes, but have not really been that serious. I asked for the repentance because I thought the Lord wanted to hear that. But did I seek the repentance like, it, like my life depended on it? Don't think so. David is saying, I'm going to ask for this one thing, and I want to seek it with all my heart. I'm going to put all my effort in that direction. And if I find desires that don't match the, this seeking, then I'm going to rebuke those desires. I'm going to put those on the back burner. I'm going to seek this one thing that's in line with what I'm asking for. So, what's he asking for? I want to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. This, this is the one thing? Okay. That's the one thing he's asking for. So what does it mean? Um, I, I do want to dwell on this for a minute because I, the house of the Lord part is really important. And so compare with me what things he might mean. He might mean, I, I've got four. We'll see how many you think of. He might mean to literally dwell in the house of the Lord. You remember the house was a tabernacle or a tent at this time of, day, of our of the Jewish life. There was no temple. That was built by David's son, Solomon. So the temple, which he does use that word, is a tent. Maybe it has some walls around it. Who knows? But essentially a tent. So maybe he wants to literally live there. That's not really possible because there aren't any rooms separate in the tent. There's no, there's no uh, guest rooms. We do have the story of, day, of uh, what, Samuel sleeping overnight inside the tabernacle because he was keeping the lamps lit. So there's that, I guess. Uh, so literally David could be asking, could I stay in the house of the Lord always? Um, number two, maybe he means I want to, I just want to be physically at worship as much as I possibly can. Um, remember the temple was a real place. And you didn't just have Jesus saying, um, uh, in my time, everybody will worship wherever they want to worship in spirit and in truth. Uh, you had to go to the tabernacle to worship. Uh, he wishes, maybe in this case, he wishes he could be in that posture of worship, gathered with the Lord's people. Uh, it, it, it's not literally possible because you had to go there and you had to leave. It was... Not a 24-7 a experience. Uh, an Israelite, when, if an Israelite said he wanted to worship, uh, a big part of what he meant was, I'm, I'm literally going somewhere, and then I'm going to leave. So let's go worship the Lord at the tabernacle. Um, thirdly, maybe David is speaking metaphorically, more like the New Testament. Maybe he's saying, I just wish the Lord was with me in every action, in every pursuit, in every place that I'm in, um, I wish and pray that God would be with me in a temple sort of way, maybe. Um, that would be a lot more Christian than Jewish, I think. Uh, you, you think of Jesus, like I already referred to it, with the woman on the well. He said that this time is changing. We're not going to do the temple thing anymore. We're going to have worship all over the world in spirit and in truth. That sounds really simple to us. It sounds really normal. But to David, that would not have sounded normal at all. You, if you wanted to go worship, you need to approach God through the temple and its sacrifices. And don't forget, God's glory was visible. It, this is not just, oh, there's a tent. This is a place where God manifested his glory, an actual shining glory would descend upon the tabernacle. Maybe it wasn't visible all the time, but it was definitely visible some of the time. And you remember when Solomon built his stone temple, there was a time when the, when the glory descended upon that temple. So when, when David says, I want to be, be like temple worshiping all the time, he's not just saying, oh, I want, I want that New Testament uh, experience. He's He's thinking of the actual glory of the Lord and all the sacrifices and all the ordinances that God put around temple worship. There is a fourth option, I think, if you've 
maybe some of you have already made this connection. In Psalm 23, there is this phrase, all the days of my life and dwell in the house of the Lord, right? Everybody's favorite psalm. Um, I, may I, I, I want to, um, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Maybe that means in the new heavens and the new earth. Maybe it means life after death. But I really kind of think David is asking for something that can be fulfilled right now. I don't think he's saying, hey, just take me after death, please. He's saying, I want to ask and I want to seek a relationship with God that is right now, that is fulfillable right now. It's a, it's a, it's a prayer request God can fulfill for me in this life. So, yes, we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, and we will behold God as he sees fit in the new heavens and the new earth. But what, what can we do now to approach God in the way that David is asking for? And David is asking, don't forget, when he says house of the Lord, he's bringing in all the ordinances. He's saying, I want to approach God the way he says to be approached. I want to obey the law. I want to come through the blood of animal sacrifices and the ordinances of the priests. I want to be ceremonially clean before I approach God. I want to do all those things that are, that are outlined for me because I want to bless God and I want God to bless me. So he's, he's very much wanting to obey God's ordinances. So he gives two reasons. Why do I want to do this? I want to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Um, I do think this is parallelism again. It's, it's Hebrew poetry. I, he's saying I want to do something and I'm going to say it twice the, in, so that there's two different ways of thinking about it. Um, but I, I do think this word inquire I'm, is a little misleading. Um, it's not... I always took it when I read this, it, I thought he meant, I want to go to the temple and make, um, you know, ask the Lord whether I'm going to win this battle or something, like you do see sometimes. The word, um, it just means digging in, examining, or again, seeking. So I, st I still believe this is more uh, parallel to the word gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. He just wants to see the presence of God. And this word beauty is really interesting too. Um, the beauty of the Lord, that probably brings lots of pictures to your mind. But this particular word isn't the normal word for beauty. Uh, it's, it's a word that means pleasantness or fittingness or suitableness. It's actually the same word that uh, Naomi's name comes from in Ruth where she says, uh, don't call me pleasant anymore because I'm not that way. Well, that's what's what her name was and so it's not just the beauty of something like a mountain or a waterfall it's the beauty of something that is absolutely fitting and absolutely suitable for us that's the kind of God we have he is absolutely what we need and David says I, in every circumstance I want my will to be conformed to to you so much that I can sense that you are suitable for me. You are what I need. Excuse me. And if I can see my need clearly, then I can gaze upon the Lord and have that. So, I want to live with the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon his beauty and to inquire in his temple. Well, a couple of things, backing up just a bit. If you're praising God for his beauty, if you're wanting to fulfill this verse, if you want this prayer to be answered in your life, one thing to be sure of is that you are focusing on the Lord and not on his gifts. This is a classic John Piper comment, and I certainly 100% agree with it. Um, don't focus on the things the Lord gives you. Focus on the actual suitability and wonderfulness of the Lord himself. Um, one way to test this in your mind is to say, well, if I was in heaven and I had everything heaven had to offer except Jesus wasn't there, would I be happy? 
And I hope the answer is no. Jesus is the reason why we want to go to heaven because we want to be with him. Another way of looking at it is to say when you're praying, hey God, I want you so much if you will just give me this one other thing. If you find yourself praying that way, and I know we all do, I know I've done it, then that other thing is God, not God, right? You're making the other thing the idol. If you're saying to God, I want you, and I want you, after you give me this one other thing that I need, I, I need it so bad, whether it's life or, or healing or, I don't know, comfort, prosperity, or just a, a request that just cannot be fulfilled, that could be your God. Make sure you're focusing yourself back on the real object of worship, God himself. Secondly, make sure it's through Christ. Um, I am so appreciated what Jeff said this morning in, in communion. It, David does not want to approach God outside of the boundaries of how God says to be approached. That's why he says, I want to do this in the house of the Lord. We've always needed an, inter an intermediary between us and God. Not only because we're finite creatures, but because we're sinners. We need a sacrifice. We need an intermediary, a mediator that will provide that for us. So God provides it himself. God says, you can't approach me, but guess what? I will fix it so you can. I will, uh, I will revoke your banishment and make myself approachable through Jesus Christ, his appointed son. So when the whole Old Testament says, I'm going to give you these types and shadows and pictures and prophecies that this is going to happen. And while that happens, you need to approach me that way through the types and the shadows. And then in the New Testament, he comes and he deals with sin. And he actually is, is crucified on our behalf so that we may approach God through the cross of Christ. So when David says, I want to go to the temple, he's saying, I want to go to the place of sacrifice. I want a place where God is showing mercy to mankind. And that's where to go. If you're David, since the time of the crucifixion, the place to go has been Jesus Christ. He's the new temple. He provides access to the mercy seat. In New Covenant terminology, we would say this, the letter of the Hebrews says, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. So do come, do pray for the, uh, the presence of the Lord, the, the house of the Lord. Do pray to be there all the days of your life, but, but pray for God himself and not for his gifts and pray through Jesus Christ. And that's, I think, the New Testament way to take this verse. So as we kind of conclude, um, what are some observations we can draw from this? I'm, I'm going to propose four. Um, I guess a real Baptist would have three, right? Sorry about that. But it's three plus a bonus. Number one is easy. Just remember that, there, that it's the word, the number one is used. There is just one thing that's needful. And here's again some other parallel verses. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. Here's another one. Seek the things which are above where Christ is. Or how about this one? I bet you haven't thought of this one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. They all amount to the same thing, right? That God alone is the object of our desires and our worship and our happiness. We've got to concentrate on knowing God. That's number one. Number two, and I've said this already, make sure you're seeking the Lord through Christ, in Christ's name. Remember that the temple in the Old Testament was the redemptive purpose of God. 
and that in the new covenant we approach through Christ. So always come. I, I can't say it as well as Jeff did already. Come, did you say push it in our face? Shove it in our face? Come to me through the cross. Uh, that is so wonderful. Make the death of Christ the ground of your ability to approach God. Or, if you want to get even more the theological about it, because the death of Christ has caused you to become in union with him. The union we have with Christ is what gives us access. Because by his dying and his resurrecting, Christ has brought you, if you're a believer, into union with himself and you have all his privileges, all his access into the Father's presence. That's why we sing Christ all the time. That's why every song says Christ, Christ, Christ. Why do we do that? Because he is our, he's our God. He's, our, he's not only our man, he's our, he's our God and our creator. He's our creator and our redeemer. He's just everything to us. Um, now, uh, here's maybe this uh, uh, switch off into a direction you weren't expecting. He does say house of the Lord, thirdly, third, third item. The house of the Lord does have another reference, doesn't it? It's not just the eternal uh, court, court of the Lord that Hebrews talks about that Jesus entered in with his own blood. It's also, he still has a temple here on earth. The house of the Lord is the church. So, not the building, okay, the church that's in the building is a place of meeting with God. The house of God is where God dwells and he dwells in his local churches. So when people quote Psalm 122 and they say, I, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord and they apply it to the church on Sunday, they're not lying. They're not, they're not taking it out of context. They're putting it into a New Testament context. I was glad this morning that I was going to meet with the saints of God in the place where Jesus has put his name to dwell. It's not just that he just generically dwells in the universal church, which I'm sure he does in some sense. He actually dwells in local churches that are his temples that he's established. I'm so glad. You might think I was on shaky ground unless we had the first three chapters of Revelation. But since we do have those, I think it's pretty clear. Jesus, he's walking among the lampstands, he's establishing his local churches, and he's holding each of them accountable to be the place where he meets with his people. So all of that is a concern for Jesus. What's happening in the local church? And that's where we can come meet with him in a very special way. To be with him where he has put his name, which is right here. Okay, so fourth, I'd say that you can use this verse as a spiritual temperature, a spiritual thermometer. You can take this verse and look at yourself. You can say, is this, are my affections matching David's affections? Do I really want what David wants here? Because if, if, our love and our affection is turned some other way, then the enemy is winning. He's not, uh, God is not against uh, excitement and fulfillment, but he wants to give us the fulfillment and the excitement, which is himself. The devil uses excitement and fulfillment and loves it as long as it's not in the Lord. So what do we love? What do we want to inherit? What are we asking for in our prayers? Obviously, the verse says, seek first his kingdom and all these things will be added to you. C.S. Lewis agreed with that. He said, aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither one. Just found that in mere Christianity again this week. So, take the time to look at this verse and reorient yourself and make it, memorize it. It's a great verse. Maybe you already have. Make it your theme song. And if you find that you have, you're, you're failing, you're despairing because I, I can't find hardly any of that in myself, then there's hope for you. It says at the last verse of the psalm, wait for the Lord, wait for him. But 
keep asking and seeking and wait for it to grow. Ask for those affections. You can even do that with church. Before you come to church, ask for your heart to be enlivened, for your heart to be thrilled to be here. Ask for the sermon to touch you. Ask for the, uh, for the sermons to break your heart or to, in some cases, break your brain and make you understand something. Ask for the songs. Uh, pray for Cody and his team and say, I need this in my soul. I need to see Christ. Come with a sense of expectation that God will use his appointed means. These are, these are actually laid down for us so that we will grow. He created local churches to do this in our lives. So do that. And there's one more thing to look for for some of you, some of you. If you find there's nothing in your heart that corresponds to this verse at all, if it just leaves you cold, or if you just say, well, I'm glad someone else has those spiritual experiences, um, you can be fairly certain that you haven't come to Jesus yet. You are not in relationship with him. This is not a charismatic gift that some Christians get and some other ones don't. The whole point of the gospel is to bring us to the Lord God. That's, that's the intent. And so if no desire for him is burning inside of you, and then the gospel hasn't taken root inside of you. And so in that case, be honest with yourself and turn and come to God today. You are in the middle of literally his appointed means of salvation because you're here. And so thank him for that and come to Jesus and say, I need that cross that he's talking about. I need that forgiveness. I need to be in a relationship with you that I've never had. Don't be too proud and think, well, somebody already thought I was a Christian. Well, that doesn't matter. It's between you and God to make that right today. He's here, right here for mercy. That's why he's established his churches. And to prove that, he became a man and died for people just like you. So if that's what you need today, then make that change. He ratified a covenant to prove his desire for this. And we just now took the signs of that covenant. And so he's created little lights around the world called churches, little communities everywhere. And he's with us today in his temple. And he's showing himself visibly once again for salvation of the lost and for the comfort of the saints. So Cody, can we sing to him one more time? Let's do it. to stand as we sing. <laughs> 